Welcome to American Players Theater Talkbacks to Go. I'm Buzz Kemper, and I invite you to take a walk up the hill with Orange Schroeder and me as Orange chats with director Ken Albers and actor Brian Monney about APT's 2016 production of Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller. Welcome. We are talking today to Ken Albers, who is the director, and Brian Monney, who's playing Willie Loman in Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. And Ken, I have to tell you that uh, back in 1992, you played Willie Loman at the Milwaukee Rep. And uh, my husband, Dean, and I saw that play, and it had a profound effect on how we treated the salesmen who came and called on us at our <laughs> shop. So you don't know it probably, but uh, theater spreads its influence in many ways. So I thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. I didn't have anything to do with that, you understand. That was Mr. <laughs> Miller doing all that work. But well, yes, but I fully understand because we had, I still remember a salesman who had come by our house when I was a kid in Illinois. He was a knife sharpener. Mm. And he would bring his, you know, seat with the wheel, and he would uh, sharpen the knives that my mom had in the kitchen, and that would, that would w- was what he was selling was the skill at sharpening the knives, and I thought at the time it was fascinating to me what he did, but I could never I could never imagine doing it, myself as a, as a young kid or even as a young adult I couldn't imagine going from house to house town to town neighborhood to neighborhood selling a skill, let alone selling a product. And yet you ended up being an actor and director going from town to town and selling your skills. I know, I know. It, you know it's sad, isn't it? <laughs> At least people came to you. That's to true. That's, that's true, yeah. <laughs> so tell us how it's different uh, directing this uh, now, uh, some years later, uh, from when you were in the uh, John Dillon production at the Milwaukee Rep. Well, I always answer this question by telling a story about Pat Riley, who was a famous basketball coach of the Los Angeles Lakers for years. He now is the general manager and the owner, I think, of the Miami Heat. Uh, He coached them for, you know, he coached world championship teams. And he said one day, a coach is times 12. The player is times one. And by that he meant, as a coach of a basketball team of 12 players, I have to think with 12 different minds. As a player, I have to think with one. And I leave the coach to think of the other 11, you know, and I fit in that, it, to that. And that's kind of like what it is for a director and an actor doing the same play. As Willie Loman, I had to think about one person and one thing only, really. I didn't have to worry about what was going on in my wife's head, my son's head. That was not an issue for me. As the director, I have to, I have to bring all of those heads together under one umbrella and try to coax or cajole or beat or, you know, (laughs) seduce uh, whatever they have to offer out of them to be be the part of that umbrella that we're creating with Death of a Salesman. So it's a much easier job for me to do that as a director than it is as an actor for some strange reason. I don't know why. Because I got all these other people doing most of the work is why. And would you say that your interpretation of Arthur Miller's work has changed in, during that time? Well, yes. I mean, when I first did Willie, I was, what, 48? Now it's, well, what, 22 years later? 32 years later? 22 years later. And so I've changed. So my point of view about the play and, and its meaning has changed as well, certainly. And, and that happens every time, whether you're acting or directing. You come back to a play you've done before, and all of a sudden... It's whether you want it to be or not, it's a new play. And Brian, have you been in the play in a different role before? No, this is my first exposure of being in the play. Uh, my my first exposure to the play. Uh, I, it was a play that I never had. Uh, many say they studied it in high school. I did not. Um, my first exposure was, uh, once again, Ken's production. Uh, the production at the Milwaukee Rep that Ken was playing Willie and... Uh, I was devastated, and I, I, I will say this, that I, I've seen four or five other productions since then, and they can't hold a candle. So I've, I feel fortunate in being led through a complex, humbling play with someone who's been there. Uh, in fact, I think you've done it a couple more times. So uh, Ken, knows, Ken knows the play. He knows the inner workings of the play in a way that I couldn't have uh, 
absorbed uh, in a normal rehearsal period. And he's, every once in a while, he reveals just a little something that just sounds like a, rings like a bell for me. And it, it's, it's good. And what would you say is the, the most um, central characteristic of Willie? What do we learn about him through this play? Oh, my. <laughs> What don't you learn about him? See, there was the question we didn't want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm still figuring him out. We're we're in the fourth week of rehearsals, and uh, I what what I find um, what I find interesting as an actor. Many times, uh, pl- other plays are written um, a little more single mindedly. Uh, not all, of course, can't categorize everything, but but Miller has written a role here. Th- who, he is so mercurial in the way he goes from fantasy to memory to almost dream state to reality again. And as we talk about it, uh, Ken came with, up with this wonderful distinction that uh, when you're you know in a real setting, when you're sitting with someone and you're daydreaming and someone snaps you out of it, the daydream has been the dominant uh, mo- uh, uh, reality for you. Even though you're, s- you're sitting at a kitchen table, you're dreaming about something else, and until someone says, Brian, and you come out of it, you have to, you have to sort of scramble to get back to what, what's going on right now. And that's what's going on for Willie all the time. He's, he's always either straddling the two worlds or... So, I, so what I think is interesting about the play, part of one of the many things that's interesting about this play is that people will see someone behaving like they do or like they see people do. And I think Willie could very much be like someone's parent or aunt or uncle or brother or themselves. It's also, I think, uh, the the fact that everybody's going to go through this. Mm. Everybody in the world is going to go through what Willie goes through, perhaps not to the extent that he does it, but... Everybody at some point is going to lose a job. Everybody at some point is going to have trouble finding a job. And by the time you reach a certain age, as Willie says at one point, they don't know me anymore. And people who did know you, for instance, even in our own own profession, theaters that did hire you, their artistic directors have died, they've retired, they've moved on, they've been replaced by people you don't know There's nobody at the theater you remember from your time working there. Your contacts dry up, you know. And so your your world of employment gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And your opportunities for advancement get smaller and smaller and smaller. And you don't face that when you're 48, the first time around playing Willie Loman. But when you're 72 or 65, you've started to face that. And all of a sudden that looks awfully familiar to me, you know? It seems familiar. It sounds familiar. I don't like the familiarity it presents me, but yeah. there it is, and everybody's going to go through it at some point. Um, even my father did. So, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a factor of life, and it's a, it's a terrible factor of life that everybody has to find a way to deal with because you lose your sense of self, the, ha, being employed at doing something is part of who you are. And it, when you think about the questions that people ask each other when they first meet, where do you come from? What do you do? Those are the two big questions. Not, how do you feel about um, women's rights? That's not the first question <laughs> right. you answer somebody when you meet them for the first time. It just doesn't happen. And part of that is simply it's easier to talk about those other things, but part of it is also because that's the way we identify ourselves. How many children do you have? Are you married? You know? And one of the things that Willie says is, uh, be liked and you will never want. And um, that, that doesn't really ring true, does it? I mean, in the long run. In some ways it does. You know, but there comes a point where it doesn't matter whether you're liked because there are going to be people who don't know you well enough to like you or dislike you. And that's when it becomes business, not personal, quote. That's when we turn into the godfather, you know, mm-hmm. corner. It's business. It's business. It's not personal. But, of course, it is personal because everything is personal. 
Well, and the play does deal with American, the, the promise, the bright promise of life in America. Of course, it, it debuted not that long after World War II, as did All My Sons. And the idea that that you have a promising future ahead of you, that capitalism will provide jobs for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, here we are many years later with those issues still facing us. Well, and also, the, you know, one of the big issues that faces Biff in the play is he doesn't... He has no affinity for business. You know, he doesn't know what to do with business and the business world. And now, people coming out of jobs they've held for ages that have been replaced by tech or replaced by computer, and they have no skills. They have no way to enter this profession at their age now. Their opportunities for employment at their age diminish exponentially each year. You know, so there's, we're still facing the same thing, and we're going to continue facing that. Everybody is. I often, you know, I often think of, okay, we got through the Stone Age. <laughs> now we're into bronze. What did the guys who only worked in stone do? <laughs> you know, how did they adjust? What do you mean what, bronze? Exactly. What are you talking about? Look at this rock. <laughs> and had they lived long enough to see steel, Lord knows what would have happened to them. Anyway. Sorry. So, so Brian, That's great. Uh, Ken just <coughs> mentioned um, his father, and of course, there's a lot about fathers in in this play. Um, do you want to speak to that? I mean, you are the father. I am the father. I am uh, I am the son of a father who grew up without a father. Mostly, my 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 grandfather died when my father was nine years old. So he many times bemoaned the fact that he had grown up without um, the guidance that he thought he might sh- might maybe should have had. Um, so I've seen that. I've, uh, I've heard my father say, Brian, I don't know what to tell you to do. I'd never had anybody tell me what to do at this point. I don't know what to tell you. You're going to have to go with your best judgment. Um, that would be good advice for Willie, <laughs> this show. <laughs> um, because he, he, uh, I think he feels the pressure of the American dream. Um, and, uh, uh, including all the foibles that he has as a human, um, one of the things that he, uh, and because of those troubles come to his life, uh, he wants his boy Biff. Biff is his life, and uh, he wants Biff to do better, and Biff is tarnished by uh, an event uh, in their lives that, that, that have stifled him. They've, they've, Biff is not able to go forward and function in the way Willie wants him to anyway. Uh, so as a, so, it's interesting to be a father of, uh, to, and to be watching over a, a family situation like that. I certainly didn't have that exactly, but um, I'm steering a ship and I'm steering it wrong, and uh, everyone suffers. Well, thank you both so much for these insights into one of America's great plays by a a playwright who just left us recently Mm -hmm. after a long and productive career. We're so lucky to have American Players Theater bringing him alive on our stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk Backs to Go is a production of Orange Tree Imports and Audio for the Arts. Your host is Orrin Schroeder. I'm Buzz Kemper. Our music is used by permission of the artist. Please find us on iTunes and YouTube under APT Talkbacks to Go. Thank you for listening. <laughs>